Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for attending the American Medical Association's Women's History Month webinar, The Intersection of Voting and Health. I am Dr. Neva Lubin Johnson, Chair of the AMA Women Physicians Section and an internal medicine physician based in Chicago. Our women members are members of w and are members of WPS, and we strongly encourage and invite all men who share our goals to opt in. I would like to introduce our mo moderator, Dr. Megan Trinovo, who is an infectious disease physician and translational health policy research, research fellow at the University of North Carolina, delegate for the AMA and resident member of the AMA Council on Medical Service. Dr. Srina Voss's research focuses on the social determinants of health and using public policy to overcome health inequity. In addition to being a 2020 Atlantic Fellow for Health Equity, Dr. Srina Voss served on the Iowa Supreme Court's Access to Justice Commission, the Infectious Disease Society of America, Public Health Advisory Committee, and the board for Iowa's National Alliance for Mental Illness. Welcome, Dr. Srinivas. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Megan Srinivas, and I'm your moderator for today. Before I introduce our esteemed presenter, I want to share one quick note about our Q&A session. At the end of Dr. Christensen's presentation, we will have time for questions. Please be sure to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, as we will not be using the raise hands feature for this session. Now, it is my honor to introduce today's presenter, the Honorable Donna M. Christensen. In 1996, Dr. Christensen became the first female physician to serve in Congress and the first woman to represent the U.S. Virgin Islands. Congresswoman Christensen chaired the Congressional Black Caucus's Health Brain Trust for 16 years, which put her at the forefront of congressional efforts to end healthcare disparities for minority communities and women, fight HIV AIDS nationally and internationally, and extend health insurance coverage. She retired from the U.S. House of Representatives in 2015 after serving nine terms. Dr. Christensen practiced family medicine and served in many public health administrative positions prior to her election. Recently, Dr. Christensen established the Christensen Institute for Community Health and Empowerment. She is also a board member of Consumers for Quality Care, the American Kidney Fund, the Black AIDS Institute, and several other boards and institutes. In addition, Dr. Christensen serves as a public health advisor to the Virgin Islands Department of Health. It is with great pleasure that I welcome Dr. Christensen to share her insights on the connection between voting and health today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sinivas. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and good afternoon to my sisters in medicine and, and our guests this afternoon. Pleasure for me to share my thoughts with you about how voting influences health and healthcare. I don't think there's one panel that I've sat on during my tenure or after Congress, or one keynote that I've had the opportunity to give that I have not extended, ended that uh, speech with the importance of voting. And not just voting, but the need to get involved in campaigns and in get out the vote activities, which are just as important. I want to extend special greetings and thank you to the chair of the women's section and one of my past NMA presidents, Dr. Neva Lubin Johnson, who of course I've had the pleasure to work with not only on the Brain Trust, but at the NMA. But I also, I don't know if they're with us, but I just will extend greetings to AMA president, Dr. Susan Bailey and immediate past president, Dr. Patricia Harris. And to them, to all of the women who've served as either board chairs or presidents since 1995. I've had the pleasure to interact with many of them as well. So today's presentation, we're going to, as the title, um, says explore the connection between voting and health and the influence that our votes have on population health and the socioeconomic determinants and of course health policy. The topic that you have chosen today is an extremely important one because without a doubt we have witnessed and we have witnessed this firsthand whether we vote, how we vote, and more specifically who we vote for regardless of party 
are determinative to the health legislation and policy that's developed and to whether they meet the goals we advocate for. Before I get into the topic, though, I want to talk briefly about how it was, how it used to be. When I first ran and lost, I lost in 1994, one in 1996. It was about the same time that women uh, be, took leadership positions at the AMA. But back then, at least in the Virgin Islands, it was thought that a woman, not to mention a black woman, could not do the job of a congressperson. That has thankfully changed, and I hope that I played at least a small role in making that happen. In 1997, when I went to Congress, I joined a very robust women's caucus that was bipartisan, collaborative, and effective. We would develop consensus on legislation that all of us could support, and we had an excellent track record in getting many of us in we have the largest ever 122 potential allies in the House and 24 in the Senate. Back then and in my several first terms, we even had a bipart we even had bipartisan retreats. We initially also had a bipartisan physician doctor caucus, which eventually later on became Republican only, but I would crash it if there was a speaker I wanted to hear from. And I just really say this and talk about what it, what, how it used to be to remind us that the bitter partisanship and the poisonous rhetoric that we see in here today was not always that way, and it doesn't have to be. The kind of Congress that we get and how it operates largely depends on how we vote. So when I got to Congress on my second run, I was late because I had a primary general and a runoff. I didn't really ever anticipate that my work there would expand and extend nationally, regionally, and even to a lesser extent globally. I was a representative with no legislative experience having come directly from my practice. And I came from a little dot in the Caribbean that many members had no idea where it was or what its status was within the nation. I came basically determined to serve my constituents, but I had promised them as I left my practice that healthcare would still remain my priority. It really wasn't until my first speaking engagement at the Office of Women's Health with Dr. Susan Blumenthal that I realized I was the first female physician to ever have served in Congress. As you, I'm sure, have heard, there have been several challenges to that distinction, but facts are facts. I'm a woman, I'm a physician, and I was the first, whether I have a vote, had a full vote or not. That, of course, was important the fact that I was the first female physician in Congress. But the biggest factor in my gaining a national voice was the Congressional Black Caucus. First, by their support of my becoming chair of the Health Brain Trust, but also by virtue of their influence in all of the sectors that represent the determinants of health. The Minority AIDS Initiative was my first baptism by fire. There was much resistance in the Department of Health and Human Services and the White House advisors. We wanted, initially, we asked for a state of emergency for Afri and HIV and AIDS in the African-American community. And the resistance was phenomenal. The effort was led by Congresswoman Maxine Waters and Congressman Lewis Stokes, but I was their right hand. They were a very effective good cop, bad cop team. And I don't think I need to tell you who was bad cop and who was good cop. The negotiations had been led by Congressman Stokes, but it, when it hit a wall, he said, well, if I can't get anywhere with this, I'm gonna call in Maxine Waters. Well, that was the impetus to get the funding increased and an unprecedented $158 million was appropriated to fund that initiative. That first picture obviously was an old one, but at 57 members today, 
The Congressional Black Caucus influence has grown over the years and is perhaps at its pinnacle. They, like the women, are voted in from across the nation. We must not let the opportunity that both of these caucuses present pass us by. That opportunity, of course, is to meaningfully advance the common goal that we share. And that goal and our North Star is health equity, something that's important not only to those who suffer from the inequities, but to each of our well being and to the well being of our country. The AMA statement on it reads. Health equity defined as optimal health for all is a goal toward which our AMA will work by advocating for healthcare access, research and data collection, promoting equity in healthcare, increasing health workforce diversity, influencing determinants of health and voicing and modeling mental health equity. And I, I, I'm gonna condition what I'm gonna say going forward from here, because although I may make references from time to time to Republicans, I, I'm, I realize that's a generalization and I'm really talking about agendas and not individual members, but how we vote or who we vote for to advance health equity needs not to be based strictly on party, but on how the candidates' positions and agendas align with ours. We, absolutely need supporters on both sides to get things done. So now let's look at some of the goals of that statement and explore how the outcome of voting might have affected them. And let's start with access to care. That's a very easy thing There's any here that without a President Obama and a Democratic House and Senate having in in 2008 that there could ever have been an Affordable Care Act. Even though there was not only strong opposition from Republicans, but there were divisions within the Democratic caucus that had to be resolved before we could even get the bill to the, to the committee. And then once the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act left the House, there were also many provisions that the Senate and White House threatened to weaken. Some were the robust inclusion of territories and the expansion of the offices and the Institute of Minority Health, among others. All of the issues that were slated to be changed took several intense Senate and White House meetings to overcome. Without the coalition known as the Tri Caucus, supported by the Progressive Caucus, again, all members voted in from across the country, we would not have been as successful as we were. Clearly, the vote in 2008 had and continues to have a major beneficial impact on health. With the coming of the Tea Party, however, Republican opposition stiffened and several provisions that were key to access were unfunded, turned back or weakened. Medicaid expansion, of course, was one of, and the waivers were some of the most hurtful. And any improvements that we thought were needed to the ACA could not be undertaken. So likewise, there can be no doubt that if the outcome of the recent election had been different, the goal of health equity, beginning with the important issue of access would not be the priority that it is today. The statement also speaks to research. In my time, I had honor and the opportunity to work on taking the Office of Minority Research at NIH to a center and then to the institute that it is today. Just getting to a center faced stiff opposition from within NIH. And though the second director that we worked on with, worked with on it, Dr. Ruth Kirstein, eventually agreed we in the CBC wisely decided it was more prudent to ensure that it was legislated into statute. The law passed in 2000, not with a controversy. It was pulled from the consent calendar because of the inclusion of the word minority. But having both Congressman John Lewis and Congressman J.C. Watt's active support of the bill got it back on the calendar and passed that very day. So in those days, despite the existence of prejudices, bipartisanship was still quite possible. And that bipartisanship worked for me and helped me to advance relevant healthcare research in another area, 
Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute created in the ACA. Congressman Fred Upton and I held out for an independent institute rather than one within HHS and won despite the chairman's very strong opposition. I think it's important to point out why I felt it was critical to the success of PCORI. It goes back to what happened with the first National Health Disparity Report, which was directed by legislation introduced by the CBC after the IOM report on equal treatment and after an unofficial hearing on that report held by the Health Brain Trust. The first report was to be issued in 2003. The initial draft essentially reported no disparities. You can imagine how that was met. But because we always had friends on the inside, someone had shared the real draft report with Congressman Danny Davis, which of course included all of the true facts and accurate facts about the disparities in our country. We insisted, of course, that that first report be discarded and the accurate, accurate one be issued instead, and it was. The point of this is that politics, as we have recently seen, can negatively twist facts and promulgate misinformation, which can be harmful and even deadly. That's why it was important that PCORI, which is doing good research and includes this social determinants, be an independent institute. And the, and the issue of data, it's impossible to achieve health equity without having robust and integrated data. The ACA's directive on expanding data collection has never been consistently or broadly implemented. Because of the last administration's failure to direct all states to collect data by race and ethnicity, not all states do, even today. And there are reports that CDC was specifically directed not to collect important demographic data in groups we especially needed to monitor, such as our essential work. I sit on a health task force with the Satcher Health Leadership Institute, and the lack of data impedes our and other agencies' ability to develop specific population-based strategies. I've also been concerned by the conflation of data during some of the um, administrations to hide data, often specific to African Americans. The issue came up when I was asked to sign on to an op-ed recently. And the sentence in the op-ed that concerned me was quoted in a narrative from CDC and is reflected in the last line of this graph, where it says that hospitals and hospitalizations and deaths were not 1.9 times higher in African Americans or Black people and 2.3 times higher in people of Hispanic and ethnicity. But when you look at cases and that separately, we see that Hispanics in our country have the highest number of cases in proportion to their presence in the population. That's quite clear on this slide. And although they also suffer disproportionate deaths, this slide, in this slide it shows that African-American deaths, deaths are higher when looked at in light of the percentage, our percentage in the population. All people of color, have suffered significantly disproportionate COVID infections, serious disease and deaths. And it's a travesty, especially since much of what we're experiencing could have been prevented. The issue for me was that all data needs to be reported fully, accurately and clearly. And I'm not sure how clear that was to most users. Before going to the social determinants, I want to talk about workforce issues because it is, they are so critical of achieving equity and access as well as in care. The ACA included issues to address increasing underrepresented minorities in the health professions, but not much seemed to come from it. The commitment from the next Congress was just not there. And the increasing conservatism of the court threatens it even further. All of that determined by how America voted or did not vote. There were also other important workforce issues that were completely ignored and that could have made a world of difference today, such as the provision that directed there be training 
for providers on the use of opiates, and another the directed invest the directed investment in expanding the public health workforce as well as the rest of the public health infrastructure. And although we know how effective community health workers can be, that grant program was not adequately funded either. Although there's no guarantee, it's more likely that a Democratic president would have ensured all, including those to increase underrepresented minorities, be implemented. But the issue of creating needed equity in, work, in the workforce goes far deeper. There's a serious and long-standing gap in funded, funding for non-white school districts. Several systems are being sued to co correct this inequity. To their credit, universities did attempt to step into the breach. The failure to address inequity in the K-12 education continues to clog the pipeline needed to fill the positions that those universities are willing to open. The Tri-Caucus has long pressed for investment in education that would eliminate inequities between children of color and their white counterparts. We are hopeful though, that because of the voting that took place in 2020, that will be a priority and will actually happen. If not, we would still not be able to meet the dire need for a more diverse health workforce. The significant reason why this country has failed to reduce health disparities that have been long known, but undeniably de demonstrated at least since Surgeon General Heckler's report in 1985. We have known and worked on the diseases that cause health inequities for years. We know what works to make and keep people healthy. We have also wasted a lot of time blaming the victims who tried to be healthy in a healthcare system that had been has been biased against them. And although there have been some improvement, it has hardly scratched the surface because we have not addressed the social, economic, and environmental determinants of health. I'm going to share a few sl more slides just briefly to underscore that they are still with us. People of color are overrepresented in high poverty tracks. And although not seen here, some Asian Pacific Islander groups are overrepresented in them as well. And um, among the most uninsured, Hispanics, American Indians, and Alaska Natives having the highest rates of uninsurance. These same groups consistently have the highest unemployment rates. They have the lowest incomes. In many areas where we live, food deserts continue to exist, as well as lights, blighted communities. People of color and the poor are dying more from environmental pollution or even just having their health undermined or threatened by it, even today. And we remain far behind our white and some Asian counterparts in representation in the health workforce, as was mentioned earlier. I could not find much after 2018 but actively practicing African-American physicians are the blue at the top, Hispanics, the green right next to it, and the sliver in between represents tribal Americans or American Indians. Looking at the percentage of medical school graduates that same year, the green represents African-Americans, the orange Hispanics or Latino med school graduates. And again, you can barely see tribal representation. Although the inequity in education that adversely affects our ability to diversify our workforce existed before COVID, the pandemic has widened the gap in ways that will be very difficult to close. That diversity is acutely needed to end the implicit racial bias 
that continues to defer or deny adequate health care to some based on their race and ethnicity. And if that is not enough of a barrier to access, new age technology already in use, such as artificial intelligence, has been shown to be used in ways that discriminate particularly against African-American patients, but likely against others as well. This study found that there is a software program that determines who gets access to high-risk healthcare management programs, favoring healthier whites over Blacks who are not as healthy and who really need those programs more. The potential for AI to harm communities of color is finally being examined and must be corrected. And no discussion of health equities inequities would be complete without looking at maternal mortality rates in this country. It is a human tragedy when a woman dies giving birth. And when the political will to prevent that is not there. Although this slide accounts only for years up to 2017, it was taken from a 2019 CDC report and a 2020 GAO report. But I also wanted to use it to demonstrate more than just Black, Hispanic, and white women. African-American women are more than three times likely to die in what is the most natural and should be the happiest time of their lives. Followed closely by American Indians and Alaskan Natives, another people whose history and culture has been devalued and trivialized and whose lives have been disrupted by race, race, racist systems. Most scholarly articles speak to events in and around childbirth or immediately after. But the disparity in these death rates, as this article points out, has everything to do with the totality of the lived experiences of Black and Native American women in this country. As with all of the disparities that African Americans and other people of color face and have faced, some for centuries, they are the product of the systemic, structural, and institutional racism on which this country was built and which it stubbornly and tragically does everything it can to maintain. These disparities, the heavy burden of chronic diseases, AIDS, other infectious diseases, and now COVID, are the result not only of behavioral factors, but more importantly on the large and small assaults which day in and day out have taken and continue to take their toll affecting not only our psyches, but our physiologic and neurologic processes. This has come to be known as weathering. And while it affects men and women, Black women are impacted more than anyone else because the racial assaults are compounded by those based on gender. It's important to note, as is being reported more and more and is stated here, that the findings provide evidence that chronic stress on health has, an important, has important implications, not only for individuals, but also for the population as a whole. All of the social determinants take their root in racism and the impact on, of racism on our health and the fueling of the inequities is pervasive and is seen and is operational in every sector of our society. Therefore, addressing health equity challenges us to move and to act effectively outside of our health comfort zone. We must. Our votes and the votes of those we can influence must be decided not on health and medicine alone, but by position on, on housing, education, voting rights, gun control, criminal justice and public safety, reform, climate change and pollution, pollution, and jobs and economic opportunities, as well as transportation and access to healthy foods on the local level. Real and sustainable remedies will require collaborations with entities outside of the healthcare space. But it is also critical that we work together to forge the political will 
without which that real and sustainable change will never happen. This is the cover of a book by Daniel Dawes, who I'm proud to say was one of our Lou Stokes Health Policy Fellows. We have come to clearly understand the importance of addressing social determinants, but that the women of the AMA have called for this webinar tells me that you understand and have also embraced the need now to deal with the political determinants that impact the health inequities we seek to eliminate. We have the scientific and medical knowledge. We understand the root causes of health disparities and the inequities that fuel them. What remains critically missing is the political will. That we and all Americans control with our votes. According to one of my mentors, Dr. Brian Smedley, and in the book, that, um, written by Daniel Dawes. He, he says, the political determinants of health involve the systemic processes of structuring relationships, distributing resources and administering power, all operating simultaneously in ways that mutually reinforce another, one another to shape opportunities that advance health equity or create, perpetuate and exacerbate health inequities. And if there's any question this further from author Daniel does, these political determinants of health are the instigators of the causes of inequities, the determinants of the determinants, which have a cascading effect on our health and life. There is a clear and determinative nexus, nexus between our health and politics, and therefore between health and the vote. Without changing the political dynamics on all levels, from federal to state and local, access, forward data, and workforce issues will be difficult, if not impossible, to change. And the adverse determinants created and maintained by systemic and institutional racism that fuel them all must change if we are serious about achieving health equity, and we must be. None of this came about yesterday. The efforts to dismantle, dismantle the systems that create the inequities have been strident and long standing, but they have been ignored, marginalized, or mischaracterized. This must no longer be tolerated. The vote is the strongest weapon we have for change. It was used effectively last year. Today, the young and old of all races, ethnicities, gender, and the non-binary in our country have awakened to its power and will use it. What is needed now more than ever is fostering, strengthening, and sustaining a unity of purpose and leadership to guide that path forward. But it's equally important. We must continue to keep the imperative that is health equity at the forefront amid all of the other issues that our policymakers, elected leaders, as well as the residents of the most effective communities have to deal with. And the political advocacy must be directed at both sides of the aisle. A lot of education is needed to politicians of all parties and to the public at large. I'm sharing this slide from uh, uh, survey sponsored by Consumers for Quality Care, of which I'm a board member. We had a uh, webinar on the results of that survey lately. But I think it serves to demonstrate the gap in understanding that we still have to overcome. On this slide, we see that most people agree that there are flaws in the healthcare system. Many also agree that there's disparity in healthcare according to income. But fewer of those survey strongly or somewhat agree that there's disparity based on race and ethnicity. And there was a larger number who disagreed. So we do have a lot of work to do. Let me just say it's been an honor to speak to the AMA Women's Physician Section and your guests, all women and people of influence and power. I don't know if you feel like I do, that the whole world has been upsided. But if you do, let me remind you of what Sojourner Truth said many years ago, because it's still true. 
She said, if the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, these women together ought to be able to turn it back and get it right side up again. These women are us. So let's do it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Christensen, for that uh, very enlightening uh, discussion of not just what we need to do from a political advocacy standpoint, but highlighting the disparities that truly exist and how we need to address that as physicians, but also as advocates for our patients. One of the things that you kept on reiterating that was really highlighted to me was the fact that we need political advocacy targeting both sides of the aisle. It's not a partisan thing. And a lot of people in public today, as you highlighted, because of how partisan our discussions have become, have really ignored that fact that we need to look at the candidate and not just the party from which they represent. Which leads me to actually one of the questions that one of our uh, attendees has asked. Uh, Lair Streeter asked, I recently read The Political Determinants of Health by Daniel E. Dawes, and a quote by Dr. Christensen stood out to me because of how shocking it was. One of the most disappointing revelations during my tenure in Congress has been the refusal by many lawmakers to follow or base their policies on what the science or research demonstrates. Instead, they have based policies on politics, even though ironically, the government is investing in research intended to strengthen the evidence base for policy decisions. How do you suggest we address widespread health inequities in times when lawmakers refuse to listen to the evidence? Well, first of all, we, the vote is important in, in that we need to vote for those people who are going to follow this, what the science tells us needs to be done. Um, yes, it, it was very disappointing to find that out. And I mean, I can remember arguing about needle ex things like needle exchange, which now are pretty well accepted, but over the years trying to, even though research showed that it did not increase the use of, of uh, illicit drugs, and it had a tendency perhaps more so to uh, bring people into treatment, um, we could not get it done until the opioid crisis came around. And there are other, there are other examples. Um, so many times as we looked at how some of our, our colleagues would, would vote and advocate for different issues, they even seemed um, contrary to the interests of the people that they represented. And, and it was it was very, very um, difficult to overcome that and difficult to deal with. So um, we really need to question our, our candidates and um, ensure that they see things the way that we think they ought to see them, you know, and that they will follow what the research, as, as was said, we pay for. The Congress pays for, the people of the United States pay for. Um, show us needs to be done. And that's uh, actually leads perfectly to Amy Engler's question, which then goes a step further. How do we organize our communities to vote for representatives who are work, willing to work across the aisle, regardless of their political party? Get involved in the campaigns and go out and knock on doors. <laughs> um, I, I still do it. I do it at home and when I can, I, I do it um, on the mainland as well. Um, but being really involved in the campaigns, once you, once you have uh, judged that this candidate is a good candidate, um, regardless of the party, and, and um, we work with many uh, uh, Republicans uh, on different issues. It was great when we used to have the bipartisan retreats because we were able to meet with their, we, we met their wives, their children, and uh, so the relationships became more human and, and we were able to sometimes find um, common ground. Not always, but sometimes. Um, but yeah, just being more involved in the campaign, if, if, uh, if I haven't answered the question, do you think I answered that question? I, I think that you did. I think that you highlighted the most important thing is being hands-on, doing the grassroots work that a lot of people don't realize is happening every day in these campaigns. Um, 
which kind of leads me to then what you were discussing with the partisanship aspect. Back in 96, you were saying it was a very different world and there was so much more bipartisanship happening. When did that shift happen? What were some of those pivotal times when you started to see things start to change to people becoming more lodged in camps rather than willing to work together? And what were some of the factors that contributed to that? And I hope it doesn't happen now because I think that when it we, when we really started to see it happen is when there was the Republicans had the White House, the Senate, and and the House. That's what I'm saying. I hope it doesn't happen again, and I don't think it will, because there's a whole different mindset right now. But um, there were times that um, Democrats would be locked out of committee hearings. Um, it was. It started to get ugly around around that time. It was, it was during W. Bush's admin, administration, and I can't blame it on him, really. It's it was some of the committee chairs uh, uh, in the House and Senate that just um, decided that they were in charge and they were going to do what the, what they wanted to do, and then with the Affordable Care Act and how the Tea Party became pro more, pro well, came out of nowhere um, in opposition to that, again, against the best interests of themselves as well as um, the constituents that those who were representatives served, um, that just took it another step further. And a lot of the Tea Party people that were elected, you know, came specifically to um, be more um, radical to their side of their issues and um, also didn't know and didn't care about what the protocols were in the House and Senate. Today, do you kind of see that thinking still standing or what have you noticed is the difference between today and kind of the transitions that's happened? It's worse. <laughs> Um, I know people say, you know, we bo uh, both sides have gone to, to extremes. Um, but when I, when I, I can't, I just don't understand how um, leader, people who are leaders in this country have been elected can still continue to promote misinformation and misinformation that um, is just con continuing to divide the country even more and, and, and create havoc, obviously, you know, between different groups and different races. Um, I, I, just, I just can't imagine. And it used to be better even before I came. I remember hearing from Lou Stokes and I think it was Bob Michael and somebody else about how it was when they were when they were there and that whole um, seminar happened because we were becoming more divided and they came to talk about how even how the minority and majority work together and when I came in that's how it was I, I served on small business committee. Um, and Nydia Velasquez and, and Bob Talent worked together um, so that when we met to mark up bills, agreement was already there. Um, even someone as hard headed as, um, what's his name from Alaska? Um, I think he just lost his election. Um, but uh, he would work with us. How do we get back to a world like that? What needs to be done now to get us back to that, that framework? You know, people have so many issues that they care about. You have to decide what's the most important um, because it depends on who, we, who you send to Congress and who you elect in the White House. It, it does, it does. And, and, and again, after, after you do that, after you vote, and we have to protect the right to vote, um, which is in jeopardy right now um, for many people. Um, and it affects everybody. It doesn't just affect African-Americans or people of color. It affects everybody 
who uh, you know wants to participate in the democracy that we have. That actually goes perfectly into Sarah Smith's question. Um, what role should organized medicine play in protecting and expanding the right to vote specifically? I think we should we we have a voice, and organized medicine has represents many voices, and it represents voices across the the whole the entire nation. So I think they have we have a big role to play. And as I said, you know, we really have to um, step more. So step out of the healthcare space and into other avenues that are important to advancing the issues that we we want to see happen in healthcare, because they're not going to happen if people are denied the right to many people are denied the right to vote. They're not going to happen if um, climate change is denied. They're not going to happen for a lot of reasons that are not specifically health, but all related to whether we're healthy as a people and healthy as a nation. When you pulled up that final slide, that really struck me, that cognitive dissonance between the people who who understand that their disparities exist, but still separate it completely from one of the major aspects that we know contribute to it, which is race. Is that cognitive dissonance actually reflected also at the same level in Congress from what you saw? Yeah, I think so. That's why I, I made the point that it's important to, to advocate on both sides of the aisle. People, Some people don't want to understand and other people really don't understand. And we don't know who to, who they are. So we got to talk to both of, to everybody. I, I th- This was not a major issue in, in the presentation by community. Um, consumers for quality care. It, it was one, but when I saw that slide, it just I, you know, I, it, it really struck me. And I said, you know, really, this is politicians will not respond unless the people respond. And if the people are are not really aware of the the fact that race and ethnicity has an impact on whether people get quality health care or not, or access to health care, um, if if the general population doesn't understand it. The politicians never will, and they won't have to act on it. That actually brings me to Kathleen Eaton's question, really about that that thought process that these disparities exist, but that a lot of people have this misbelief that it's tied to money purely rather than race. She's asking, because of the serious flaw in thinking, how do we respond to that when we meet somebody who has that kind of belief? And then whether they're an elected official or somebody in the community about to cast a vote, how do we address that? Well, there's a fair amount of evidence that across income lines, um, people of color still suffer disproportionate um, illness and premature death. Um, so if somebody's willing to listen to facts, um, which not everybody is, and sometimes um, sometimes you just can't, you, you, you're not gonna be able to get across to everybody, but one person at a time, and you, you just try um, to show them that, that's not, that it's not just income. Income is part of it. Income is part of it, and some uh, people of color have lower incomes for the most part than um, than the white population and some of the Asian population because it's not they're a, a, a multi uh, faceted culture, and some are at the high level and some are at the low level of income there too. Um, there's actually a question here. Uh, from Amy Burkett, asking a little bit more generally, what do you advise to physicians who are interested in running for Congress to be a part of the solution? Um, run. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I, I never thought I was going to run for office. So it wasn't like it was a planned thing from, I was always involved in politics, but always behind the scenes. Um, seat became available and everybody kept pressing me to 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 um to run but i don't think they would have done that if i'd been active in my community 
So you have to show an interest. I think be, if you have a passion, get it. That's whether it's medicine or outside of medicine, get involved in the community. Um, learn more about your community. Um, let them learn more about you if you're interested in going into politics. Um, and get involved in, in campaigns and see, how, see, see the, um, the good and the bad and the ugly so you know what you're getting into. Yeah, and you know, some women um, that came in with me came in with small children. I don't know how they did it. I mean, some maybe one was wealthy enough that she could hire um, someone to take care of her children. Others had extent, very supportive extended families, but um, I find it difficult to think about um, being in Congress because it, it it's, your life is not yours anymore. It's not. It belongs to the people you represent and it belongs even beyond that. But uh, yeah, so I was very fortunate that at the time that that happened, both of my children were in college. And that actually brings me to kind of your story and how what you were describing. You ran initially in 1994 and then ran again in 1996, which shows a lot of our, our very effective elected leaders, such as you, as well as President Obama, they lost their first election before they took that big stage. Mm -hmm. What was it during those two years that made you say, hey, I need to do this again? What did you do to prepare yourself for the run again? Because after a loss, it's always tough initially. I, I know personally for myself, but also for anybody else who's run for office, it, it is uh, a tough thing to become so resilient, but such an important thing. So I'd love to hear what you did. And pay off debts. <laughs> get to pay off my my first campaign. Even though I lost in the primary, um, and it was a big primary. And then I tried, you know, supporting the person who actually won. But that was um, that person was not working out really well for the for the Virgin Islands. And um, I hadn't. I thought maybe I would take the 1996 off because I didn't want to go back into debt right away. I need to get back into my practice and um, run in 1998. But I realized then that if, if I really was going to run, I had to run then. Um, and so I just made my back strong and jumped right in. But it, it was the when losing in the primary in my first race, I mean, I, I slept like a baby <laughs> because you running for office is no easy. Um, it's not easy. And um, but when I ran the second time and I ran in a primary against somebody that I, I kind of grew up with. And then I ran in the general against the sitting lieutenant governor and the incumbent. And I got the most votes, but we had to get 50 plus one, 50% plus one. And so we had to have the runoff. And then when I got to Congress, everybody else had gone through orientation already. I never, I never went through orientation. I had to learn, you know, by the seat of my pants. And um, but everybody was so helpful. Uh, everybody, Democrats, Republicans, everybody. And and we had a large freshman class. The, one of the first things we did is the Republicans and Democrat freshmen went on a retreat. Uh, yeah, but um, yeah, it, it's it's. I think the the toughest part is making up your mind to run the first time. Makes sense. That makes sense. And yeah. what was it that that made you decide to run the first time? I know you mentioned a lot of people were urging you to, you'd been involved in politics. What made you say this is the time I need to do this? This is the position I have to make the jump. Well, I, I've been act. I really had been really active in the community, doing a lot of different things, and um, not all medical. Um, and I guess as I as I looked at the the group that were running, you know, it just didn't. I, I couldn't find anybody I could support. Um, for one reason or another. Some just 
I, I didn't think they, they had what it took. Some I thought were running for the wrong reasons. Um, it was it was a it was a hard decision. It was a really hard decision. It was a hard decision to leave my practice. Um, I've been practicing family medicine for twenty one years. Um, it was hard to just decide to to jump into something that I had not really done before. I had run for smaller offices. I'd run for school board. I'd run and on one, and I I was the national committee woman for the Virgin Islands. So I I also had some um, been in contact with some members of Congress before. So it, I'm not sure why I did it, but. <laughs> There was a lot. Of, there was a lot of urging to do it, and and on the other side, those who were not supportive were saying, you know, she needs to stay and be a doctor. We need doctors. We don't need more politicians. Well, we're very glad that you did do it. Um, yeah, I had two wonderful. Um, I have two wonderful professions that uh, wouldn't give either of them up for anything. Well, we're grateful for the work you've done and I can't believe it, but our time's already coming to a close. So I wanna leave with one last question. Speaking of the work you've done, of all the, the things that you have accomplished and helped to move forward in, in our country during your time, either in Congress or even after or before, what is the thing that you are the most proud of? And what would you leave as one piece of advice for all the physicians here today as to what we need to do to take steps to follow in your footsteps? I think that um, the work that I did on the Affordable Care Act, um, we started very early. First of all, we started with the uh, Health Equity and Accountability Act in 2003, which dealt with workforce, it dealt with the diseases that caused it and caused the disparities, it deal, dealt with um, just about everything that you could think of that would bring about health equity. And uh, it wasn't until the Democ we were in, I think I was in the minority for the first um, half of my Congress. But when the D Democrats came in, we finally got a hearing. But we could never get any traction on, on the bill. So when the, thought, the discussion started around healthcare reform, we got ver involved very early sometimes having to go to the Senate because they were the ones that were mainly talking about it and sitting in on some of those meetings. But we developed benchmarks based on the Health Equity and Accountability Act. It takes a lot of persistence, okay? From 2003 to 2010. And so, but it was a tricaucus effort. It was a tricaucus, the Asian, Hispanic, Asian Pacific Islander, Hispanic and Black. And um, we developed benchmarks um, and we took input from our Health Brain Trust participants to develop that. We work with community organizations, you know, health advocacy organizations. And of course we worked on House and, and the House and Senate. And um, so when the opportunity came, we took some of those provisions and developed a, a health equity agenda based on them for the ACA. So, um, although everything was not fully implemented, I think I think that there's a lot in there. There's the Institute at NIH. There's, um, but I think that I would count that as the, the most important work that I did. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Christensen, for being here today. I know that Dr. Lubin Johnson uh, wanted me to to say this. She put it in the comment. Um, I want to publicly thank my friend of nearly 30 years for presenting today and including two of my other favorite persons in health equity, Daniel Dawes and Brian Smedley. Yes. Uh, I, <laughs> and I really want to thank you as well on behalf of the women's physician section for not just being here today, but for being the first female physician in Congress and helping to change the face of medicine for the better and the face of healthcare in this country for the better and setting a a role for strong women to be involved in political advocacy. Thank you well, all. Thank you. And I know I'm speaking to a lot of strong women out there and I look forward to seeing and hearing from all of from them. 
Thank you all for being here to the attendees. I'm sorry if we couldn't get to all of your questions, but there were some really brilliant questions there. And I look forward to having those conversations more in the future. Thank you.